good evening, everybody, and uh, apologies again for this uh, brief delay. Uh, Lord and Lady Deben had a problem with the uh, motorway system locally, and uh, that was uh, soon rectified, and we're very grateful to, to see you here, sir, uh, this evening. This, of course, is the annual uh, Vitacrest Conservation Trust lecture. Um, the Vitacrest Conservation Trust focuses on environmental initiatives associated with salad and watercress crop production. Its two main objectives are to preserve and conserve the wildlife and habitats associated with watercress and other salad crops, and of course to undertake research and analysis into the wildlife associated with chalk streams and other habitats associated with watercress, watercress and salad crops. And of course, very much a local uh, company uh, based here in Hampshire, and it's a huge pleasure to have uh, uh, our vice press colleagues with us tonight. Uh, I should also mention that the new patron of the Vitacrest uh, Conservation Trust is Lady Alison Wakeham, uh, who is with us uh, again with uh, Lord Wakeham himself, who uh, again a, a colleague of uh, Lord Devens uh, uh, from, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, from some time ago now, uh, if I'm not impolite in saying so. Uh, tonight's, <laughs> tonight's lecture is uh, hosted jointly by the uh, Vitacrest Conservation Trust and by two of our um, strategic uh, research groups, basically our Institute for Life Sciences and our uh, research group on, on energy. They both will come together to try and join things up across the institutions we like to try and do. And it's a terrific testimony to the work of those groups that we have such a splendid audience uh, here tonight. Uh, the global challenge raised by issues around energy and climate change are, of course, an important focus of, of the research we do here. We've got many researchers engaged in this, uh, in this activity. And uh, uh, the Right Honourable Lord Deben, uh, uh, of course, uh, has uh, held various cabinet posts in the Heath, Thatcher and major governments. And after that, whilst in opposition, he was instrumental in passing the Climate Change Act in 2008. In his current role as Chair of the Committee on Climate Change, Lord Deben has warned the government that the UK is putting at risk billions of pounds of investment, <coughs> tens of thousands of jobs, and the success of its long-term clean energy uh, strategy by delaying the introduction of decarbonisation target for the power sector. I'm going to say no more, uh, leave Lord Demon to give his talk tonight. He told me that he doesn't bother with PowerPoint or any of that nonsense, so <laughs> I'm looking forward greatly to hearing what he has to say. Thank you. So, I learned a long time ago that I had an effect on technology, and therefore it was better not even to try to make the PowerPoint work. I'm very pleased to discover that there is some research now that shows that people remember less of any speech given with PowerPoint. So that is extremely helpful and that gets me out of the problem. Now, uh, first of all, I apologize for starting late. Uh, um, and uh, I want to start by admitting that it seems to me very important for all of us, very simply, all the time, to go back to why it is we're having to deal with this issue. And the reason that I say that is that uh, there are many people who would prefer to live in a world in which uh, complex matters did not uh, intrude. Uh, we've just had some county council elections which show that in a very clear way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are people who say, this is the kind of world that I'd like to live in. Uh, there are several people who think we uh, aren't living in that world. Well, I'm going to assume that we are. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry, I'm going to assume, for example, that we aren't uh, only 22 miles off the coast of, uh, uh, of France, and therefore we can live our lives as if we didn't have anything to do with Europe. And then there are other people who say, well, it's jolly inconvenient if you tell me that there's climate change. Um, inconvenient in all sorts of ways, so I, I don't believe there is. <laughs> and so we'll assume there isn't. And then there won't be. And it's that last bit that's a trouble, because there is, and there will be. Uh, and I want to start off by admitting that I very much like not to believe in climate change. That's the first thing. I wish I didn't have to. I also want to say that I'm a skeptic, in the sense that I uh, am trained enough to know that anybody who wants to deal in science has got to be skeptical, because that's what science is about. It's about asking all the time, is that the answer? What's the problem? Do we really know the answer to that? And where are the doubts? So I don't call the people who don't believe in climate change sceptics, I call them deniers. Because actually they're not sceptical. They start from the assumption, either because it's convenient or because they'd like it to be, 
that actually climate change, if it is happening, uh, isn't caused by human beings, or it may be caused by human beings, but actually it doesn't matter very much. Uh, I went to a, uh, a debate the other day, and a very prominent politician, a member of the House of Commons, spoke before me. And he used the following statement. He said, I've just flown in from Sri Lanka. And the temperature in Sri Lanka is a good deal more than four degrees different from the temperature here. So you see, a four degree increase in temperature doesn't matter. <laughs> I found it very difficult to argue that case. It seems to me that if you start from there, you're not going to get anywhere. So I want to start really from the point of view of saying it would be very good if we didn't have to believe in climate change. But once you do understand that the science so clearly and increasingly makes that the most likely, and I only put it that way because I want to go on being skeptical, uh, the world would want you to say that it's certain, but then there is nothing certain. I mean, I thought I would get here on time. <laughs> and, uh, we lead our lives on the basis that uh, we accept certainly you all thought there was going to be a lecture here. <laughs> now, there might not have been. But you operated on the assumption that the likelihoods, and in most of our lives the likelihoods turned out to be the realities, that the likelihoods uh, are how we lead our lives. And if you don't do that, you lead your life on the basis of the unlikelihoods. We've done make a very sensible way of leading a life. And, and that is where we are with climate change. The likelihood as to, well, so high as to be uh, uh, in most people's parlances or certainties, the likelihoods are that climate is changing, that it is changing because of human beings' intervention, and that that makes a challenge which is particularly difficult. Now, it's difficult because, first of all, we know, and because we know, we have a responsibility to act. Now, when I was doing some particular work on climate change, my eldest son uh, was writing a book on the Black Death. And as always happens, as many of you here will know, and others of you will certainly know in the future, if you have a, a son writing a book, you are the first one who's supposed to read through the chapters as they come off the computer. And as they came off the computer, I read them in between times doing my own work on the climate change. And, and what really struck me, therefore, was that in the occasion of the Black Death, which after all was a horrific thing, one in three of the population died. They didn't know. It happened to them. They were struck by it. And indeed, they did all the wrong things. They went on pilgrimages. They all gathered together in churches. They prayed together and gave it to each other. That's what happened. Because they didn't know, so they called it an act of God, which I think is very hard on the Almighty, but that's what they did. They did an act of God. Because they didn't know. Now, the terrible thing, and I mean that properly for us, is that we do know. And when you know, you have a responsibility which is really very tough indeed. And the problem for human beings is that we're not very good at taking the next step, which is to say, if we know, we have to act as well as we can. And what we're trying to do, therefore, is to, having known, to see what is the best way forward. Now, I don't think there is any space now for argument about whether climate change is happening or not. The likelihood is so great that not to act as if it is happening would be a gross dereliction of duty. And you can think about it, I think, in a sense, like, um, like insurance. I often say I'm an insurance man because chairman of the Climate Change Committee, I am charging every uh, consumer of gas and electricity £60 a year extra in insurance. And I'm using that to decarbonize the uh, electricity system. That's what I'm doing. And at its height, in 2020, we'll be charging you £100 per 
consume. I mean, have some. That's what we do. Now, to put that in context, I don't know of anybody who doesn't insure their house against fire. And yet you have a 99.2% chance of your house not burning down. We still think that we should insure it. And the reason is that it is so horrific if the fire took place, it would do so much harm to the family and to the family's, uh, the family's economics that you say, it's a tiny, tiny possibility, but I won't sleep at night if I don't pay 140 pounds, because that's the average, 140 pounds insurance against fire. So all I'm saying to you is that no sane person in those circumstances, faced with the realities of climate change, no sane person would say, oh, I'm not going to take any notice about it. And, and I'll sum it up, and I, I hope that um, there'll be no uh, reaction from Lady Wakeham from, from the word I use, or from Lord Wakeham from the story, but I'm told that I'm allowed to tell it. And it's the story of, uh, of, um, uh, of Tristan Gallagher, <coughs> who's a, a colleague of ours in the House of Lords, He's one of the more amusing colleagues uh, and, and great fun. But he's, uh, he's a pretty tough individual. And he tells a story about himself, and he tells me that I'm allowed to tell it. And he said he went up to Lord Lawson on one occasion, and he said to him, look, Nigel, when I hear you speak about climate change, I think, well, you've got a point there. Yeah, you've got a point. He said, then when I hear John Gall speak about it, he said, um, I think he's got a point too. And then I think, Nigel, if you're right, and he's wrong, and we do what he suggests. All we've done is to clean up the atmosphere a bit, probably done things in advance of the time we'd have to do it, given we've got nine billion people, and that's all that's happened. It costs us a bit of money. But if you're wrong, and he's right, we bugger up the planet. <laughs> he said, there isn't a question. There isn't a question. Any sane person would accept that. Now, the reason I go into that, all this audience, I'm sure, accepts that without, but we've all of us got to be better at explaining it to people. We've all of us got to be better at winning converts. Because the danger, and that's what the title is about, how should we respond? The danger is that there are an awful lot of people who don't want to respond because they'd like it to go away. They just don't want to come to terms with it. And the trouble is that what we have to do is going to make a lot of people have to do slightly different things and organize their lives in slightly different ways. And actually, it can be done, but it just means that people find it inconvenient. That phrase, the inconvenient truth, was a very good one. They just find it inconvenient. This is... Uh, <laughs> not the most modern of lecture theatres. If I looked too carefully at the lighting, I might find that it could be improved. <laughs> Indeed, I know jolly well it could be improved, because it isn't the sort of lighting which uses the least amount of electricity. And we've just got to say to ourselves, then that's wrong. We've got to make sure that stops. And we've got to do that at the university. So there's some people to be converted here. And we have to do it at every level. I went around a new school building the other day. Beautifully done. Architecture sold them on. Solar panels. Dealt with all the things you can think of. And I went in the loos. And I said to him, I said, I'm curious loo here. I said, this is supposed to be the boys part of the school. I said, this is the boys loo. It's got one of those hieroglyphics. You know those things that go on the, on the doors telling you which one it is. I always think they're awful. Why they can't put the word on? I'm just going to have a look at the other one to make sure I'm going to find the other buildings, but the other one's going to find the other one. But, 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 uh, the, 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 and it's funny, you know, we, we gave up our good 3,000 years ago. I didn't think we'd got to suddenly start again, didn't we? I said, this is the boys' loo, and they're, they're all sit down loos. I said, why are they no new lines? Oh, it's, it's a very, very good building. We don't know how many girls and how many boys we have in the school, and therefore we're going to be able to swap them over if necessary. I said, but have you thought about the water usage? Why don't you have, uh, why don't you have your rhinos which are waterless urinals? Well, you see, the architect hadn't told him about that because that wasn't, that wasn't smart enough. That wasn't the sort of thing you sold the parents on. Can't get up and say we're doing an awful lot for the environment because we've got waterless urinals. It doesn't have the same reef. But the truth is, my first answer to this is, how shall we respond 
is, is to accept that there's a very large number of things which we can all do which add up to a very large thing. And that that's terribly important to start with because the trouble with politicians and movers and shakers is they want to move big things and shake a lot. In other words, they, they want to have a big answer and preferably a silver bullet kind of big answer and they are not terribly interested in looking at these things on a much more incremental way and that actually is a very important part of what, of what we're talking about. So here is the government headlocked with uh, EDF on trying to get the first and hopefully the second nuclear power station. Now I'm in favour of nuclear power. I happen to think that decarbonisation is about having both and and not either or. And anybody who tells me that any of these things which are either low carbon or no carbon are uh, not good enough and we don't want them, uh, they don't really take climate change seriously. Because what they mean is that their opposition to nuclear power, for example, is more important than their understanding about climate change. We, we've actually got to use it all. But we mustn't be led astray by believing that it's only the big things that make a difference. So I'm unpopular when I say the first issue is that we have to find ways of using less energy, which is more important than finding ways of having carbon-free energy, because it's the first step. And using less energy is manifestly, obviously possible. And you do it in two ways. One is by energy efficiency. In other words, by, by using less energy simply because what you're using is much more energy efficient than the alternative. And the second way to do it, actually, is by finding things which show that you don't actually need the energy at all. We're doing some work with a company in my business. We're doing some work with a company which has learned how you can run the whole of uh, a barn chicken operation with no energy whatsoever. In the sense that what they discovered is that if you have a particular breed of chicken, ideal for the uh, sales that they want, and if you feed them um, particular mix, and provide them with water and they will wander about and as cheerful as chickens are. Actually, you can use the chicken shit to power the, power the lights and the heat. And what's more, you only use 40% of the uh, FYM, Army of Manure is what I'm supposed to call it. Uh, you only use 40% of that and the other 60% you can turn into electricity to go into the grid. So there, you've actually stopped taking any energy from the uh, uh, normal means of generation, and you've started to make it for yourself. So you're now not only breeding chickens to eat, but you're breeding energy, and you're doing it together. And that's not going to make a huge difference, but it turns the whole of the chicken industry, well, the whole of the free-range and barn chicken industry, into a low energy industry instead of one of the two bits of agriculture which are high energy intensive. The other being uh, pigs, indoor pigs. I haven't yet discovered whether we'll be able to do the same with indoor pigs and I'm beginning to be a bit bored with having to delve into the, um, into the material that we're dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm leaving that to others. But, but, but in other words, there are all sorts of in fascinating ways in which we can make <laughs> and, and some of these things are just to stop using energy. I did some work for Coca-Cola, very much a leader in all this, but some years ago. And, and when we looked at it, we discovered that they were refrigerating the Coca-Cola um, syrup uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on the boats coming between Puerto Rico and the mainland um, because they always had done. But it was 20 years before when the refrigeration was no longer necessary. But somehow or other, because it had been done, people had forgotten why they were doing it. And the change took place. It saved a lot of money. I mean, it was, uh, you know, after for a very long time. I try to remind them every now and again. 
But, but there are, in other words, uh, lots of areas where we can help to contribute towards this important factor of dealing with our energy needs, which are not sexy and which are not going to engage politicians and are not going to get our headlines, but which involve each one of us and each one of our organizations and institutions doing things more sensibly. Just simply boiling the amount of water you want in a kettle. If everybody did that, we could close one power station. Instead of filling the kettle up, heating it all up, takes longer, and then you leave a lot of water to get cold again. And that is what most people do, until you get uh, bossy about it, like I am, and therefore pull out for a bit with the family, but then everybody takes the same, and they become bossy with other people, because of that, what I'm <laughs> So, first way of looking at it is we start with us. When, when I was a politician, uh, and of course I'm an entirely independent now as chairman of the Climate Change Committee, uh, when I was a politician, uh, I often used to find on the doorstep, and I'm sure um, Lord Wakeham uh, found it too, people who'd say, oh, somebody ought to do something about that. And as is easier if you've got a majority of 22,000, <laughs> I used to say to them, well, let's start with you. What are you going to do about it? And actually, that's where we have to start. I mean, genuinely, we have to start by saying, what are we going to do about it? Because if we don't do that, two things happen. One is that we don't get the things done. And the second thing is, we don't learn what are the difficulties. Because unless you're doing it yourself, you don't understand what are the things that really stand in the way. That doesn't excuse not going on to the next step, which are one of the big things. Well, first of all, we do have to accept the fact that we need to decarbonize our electricity system by the year 2030. We've actually got to get there. Because that's the only way in which we're going to be able to have the things that we want to have without damaging the climate. Decarbonisation of the electricity system is absolutely crucial, and we'll need to do that on a whole range of ways. And it's essential uh, because of other forms of insurance. I said I'm an insurance man. I'm insuring you uh, on climate change, but I'm insuring you too on two other things, and they link together when we come to think about what we do about the decarbonisation of electricity. The first thing I'm insuring you for, uh, given the results that I've mentioned about local authority elections, uh, I use the words that they would like, uh, I'm talking about energy sovereignty. Because the problem we've got is that uh, unless we have a portfolio of uh, energy supplying mechanisms, then we are going to be in the hands of people who provide our energy. And to put it bluntly, in the privacy of this room, uh, I don't want to put my children in the hands of Mr. Putin's children. It's very simple. I just don't think that's a sensible way to proceed. And we shouldn't try to proceed in that way. We should say to ourselves, we do not wish to be dependent upon imported gas. I should come around to fracking in a moment words you have to say very carefully. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, um, we, we shouldn't put ourselves in the hands of, of the gas suppliers. Uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons, but just remember, we're going to have 9 billion people by the mid-2030. Do you think that, you know, this idea that we're awash with gas, we're not awash with gas, even if they're right about the most wonderful figures. The fact of the matter is, the pressures on getting that gas because of the huge number, not only of people in totality, but much more importantly, of what one could, using old-fashioned old words, middle-class people. In other words, people who've got choices, who are not living on subsistent level, who are, who are choosing as we choose. And there'll be a, there'll be a billion more of those. And, and those pressures upon energy, which are at the center of production, those pressures are going to be huge. So the idea that gas is going to somehow other to be a cheap option is actually nonsense. Indeed, the International Energy Authority says that uh, gas prices in the United States will double over the next 10 years. And that's what's going to happen there. In the rest of the world, of course, which hasn't had the advantages which they particularly do about fracking, we're going to be in a probably worse position, however much gas you assume is there. So there is a real reason for doing this unconnected with climate change, and that is to be able yourself to be independent about your supplies. Particularly important because 
Um, certain newspapers, not unaddressed to the Daily Mail, um, do, do, do not seem to understand that there is no national energy price. They talk about fracking as if you get cheap gas because it's in Britain. But of course there is no British gas price. Uh, in or out of the European Union, uh, if that's something you even contemplate, in or out of the European Union, you, there is a European gas price. If you produce gas in Britain, do you really think that Podrilla producing gas in Britain would sell it cheaply to Britain rather than sell it more expensively to France? Of course they wouldn't. There is a different price regionally because of transport, serious transport. So there is a different price in the United States, always has been, from, from the price in, in, in Europe. But there will be a European price. And if we produce it here and the price of the rest of Europe is higher, they'll be selling it there. So don't think there's a cheap price around anywhere. So then you want to look at um, what the likelihood of fracking is I rather enjoy having the arguments about fracking. Of course, there's nothing wrong with fracking, and we will need gas. We will need a good deal of gas for quite a long time, particularly for those who are off the electricity grid, where heating has got to be done in a different way. So I'm not suggesting that we won't be able to use all the gas we're likely to frack. But let me just put this to you. You know all these people who don't like wind. And you know how these people say to you at uh, you know, parties and, and when you're having a drink, they say, oh, of course, absolutely understand about climate change. Absolutely, I'm with you on that. I just don't like these women. I mean, offshore it's very good, but not, not onshore. Don't like those stop. Well, if you think it's difficult to get planning commission for a windmill, you just think of getting planning commission for a fracking situation. Huge industrial operation which then has to move because, it, because the situation is that you, you can't just put it there like, a, like a, 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 an oil rig where, of course, you put it down and it draws the oil to it. You can't do that. You have to move it along to where the, where the pockets of gas are. And, of course, we're not like the United States in two ways. One is nobody cares to who's what Nevada looks like. But I don't know whether you know that. But, um, but I don't know whether you've looked at what the what the geological survey suggests. It is that some of the best places to get gas will be the South Downs. Now, can you imagine the district council, the Wealdon district council, <laughs> 46 conservatives, two independents, and three UK. There we are. <laughs> and they're sitting there, and somebody says to them, will you give planning permission for one of these on the South Down? I can just see them putting their seats at risk on that subject. You're not going to get it. Uh, you might get it somewhere else, people say. Well, the next most popular one is the Somerset Levels. And the Somerset, do you think you're going to get it there? Are you going to get it on the Lincolnshire Wolds? The, the, the idea that this is going to be an easy, simple answer. It's important to go through these facts. First of all, because people need to know them. But secondly, it's important because it shows how easily people will run after a simple answer and believe it without looking at any of the facts. Um, several newspapers have been running articles to say how this is going to be such a simple answer. They've not asked the questions about this that they ask about climate change. They've not asked the tough questions about this. All they've done is to say, they're jolly convenient, wouldn't it be, if we suddenly had a lot of gas and we did as well. Let's do it as well as the Americans. Well, first of all, you can't. Secondly, we don't have it like that. And thirdly, it's, we've got a thing called planning commission. And fourthly, we've got quite high environmental controls. And this doesn't work at all if you don't stop the methane uh, uh, coming. You've got to get rid of the uh, fugitive gases. But um, just think about the Americans. When it says it's wonderfully cheap, this gas. Well, of course it is, because they're producing so much. And they've got to produce it, because when you put uh, the way Americans operate, you, you, you put down a stake. It's like the old-fashioned way of gold mining. So you put a stake down, stake, and but you've got to produce within three years. So they are producing at a cost of four to five dollars and selling it one dollar. <coughs> now, in my mathematics, suggests that that can't go on for very long. My input is that the price of flat gas in America will be something between six and eight dollars. That's the fact. And the banks are begging to be very difficult. They're not lending money on new fracking operations because they're beginning to realize what the maths are. 
Now, it's very true that America will go on fracking because it provides them with energy security. And that's a great thing. And they're right to do it. And that's perfectly reasonable. But don't pretend that you can do here exactly what you do there. Let's get the facts right. Let's try to get people back to the facts, which is really what all of us have got to do all the time. What are the facts? Not what are the hopes, not what you'd like to have, not what would be very convenient, but what are the facts? So I'm providing you with uh, not only help on climate change, but also protecting you from high gas prices and giving you uh, uh, sovereignty. So that's quite a good three bits of insurance for a price which is uh, less than half what you paid for uh, uh, the uh, uh, danger of your house burning down. So decarbonisation is at the heart of it. We've got to have uh, we've got to have uh, low carbon and no carbon electricity, offshore wind, onshore wind, photovoltaics. Price of photovoltaics now fallen to such a degree that in Germany they are installing more and more of it without any support at all. Because that's what happened. Indeed the Germans are so worried about that that they're now trying to get the European Union to have an anti-dumping operation against the Chinese because they brought the price down so low. Very odd, isn't it? And leading the environment on the one hand and trying to protect your own internal uh, uh, industry on the other hand. There are a lot of enemies in all sorts of places. And guess who's supporting them? Oh, funnily enough, the energy producers. They're all supporting the idea of stopping uh, an anti-dumping operation because, of course, now that you have so much of localised uh, generation, you get a real problem. And it's a problem we can't ignore, which is that the way we pay for electricity in the past is that we know that there's an expensive bit in the middle of the day. You had to charge people expensively to leave for that, and you use that money to buy a lot of extra generating capacity. Well, now, funny enough, the sun tends to shine at that particular time. <laughs> so where are people not taking out of the grid? Where are they putting into the grid? at a low price, in effect, uh, well, it's at lunchtime. So who is now halved the value of their companies? Well, the German uh, electricity generators. So there's going to be a real issue which we've got to deal with, uh, which is how you enable energy companies to have enough stuff on the grid to maintain the service for those who don't have. Uh, immediate access to photovoltaics. It's going to be very much more complicated than we thought it was to. So, secondly, it's a question of decarbonisation of the electricity, electricity uh, generating system. And thirdly, it's uh, a recognition, and this is a crucial thing, it is a recognition that this is the transient period. We're moving from one generally solid state of fossil fuel production of electricity, of uh, running our society on the basis that you can waste as much electricity as you like, actually running our society on very low energy costs, moving to a position in which we will have a system which doesn't damage the climate. And the problem is that period in between, which will have all sorts of disruptive situations, like that one I just mentioned in the German electricity. Now, the reason I bother to do that is that it's, this gives huge opportunities for all those people who want to say, with St. Augustine, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. <laughs> and that is a big risk for us, because having had to deal directly with the climate deniers, we will now have to deal with the people who say, I'm on your side, but we really can't do this because of the energy intensive industry. Is this problem uh, about way we are going to leave it for a bit because we can't quite do it now? What we've got to bring home to people is that there isn't that. So climate change isn't waiting for us. No good saying, I'm very sorry, climate change, we mind putting off the effects for a bit because because we haven't got we haven't really got our ducks in it. And then there are the most dangerous people of all. Um, there are the people who say, climate change is happening. It's happening by human beings, but the best way to deal with it is to let the market sort it up. 
All we have to do is to leave it until it's so obvious that the market will solve the problem. Now, I'm a free marketeer. Uh, I wrote Mrs. Thatcher's speeches, so don't tell me I'm a nasty centralist Marxist. I'm not. <laughs> but the problem with climate change is that the longer you leave it, the worse it is. It's not just that it's more expensive, which is the very important work that has been done uh, economically uh, by some of the best economists in the world. It's not just because it will be more expensive there. It is that the more you allow it to go on, the bigger the problem you have. And so it's not just a question saying, we will do what we have to do, but 20 years later at a bigger price. Because that's what they say. I mean, I hear that. I heard this again, again, from Lawson says it all the time. He says, our economy will be different, it'll be bigger, it'll be twice as big, it'll be three times as big, and therefore paying for it then will be much easier. The trouble is you then left it for 30 years more of changing the climate, something you can't reverse, so that you will actually have not only a more expensive price to pay, but you will have a much bigger problem to solve. And we have to explain that to people, that it isn't the simple business of saying, let the next generation pay for it, I know it will cost them more, but frankly they'll be richer. The truth is, as Lord Stern said, we will put off the increase which we expect in our economic, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in the expansion of the economy, we'll put off that increase for a matter of a year and a half. That's what will happen. In other words, we won't. We'll have to pay money which we would otherwise have had for a matter of a year and a half, perhaps two, if we do it now. If we don't do it now, we'll have a much bigger problem and the cost will be very much larger. On the Climate Change Committee we have uh, probably the best uh, scientists in the world. There are only seven members of it. Two of them are economists. Because we're conscious of the fact that the world must be given the opportunity to understand that we don't look at these things merely from the scientific point of view and say this is what the truth is so you've got to do it. We look at it from the scientific point of view and then say, how economically can you afford to do this? How can you manage that? But we aren't foolish enough to say that you can put it off. Because that is economically ludicrous and it puts you in a position in which you probably couldn't solve it anyway. <coughs> so I come back to the beginning. The challenge is very fundamental. And I make no apologies for this, but I, I often think that, as I get older, that we should all remember the real truth <coughs> of the first chapter of Genesis. The thing that the first chapter of Genesis says is, once you know, know you can't unknow. Once you know, you become a wholly different person. Because now, you are responsible. I remind you of my comment about the Black Death. They were able to say, it's an act of God. <coughs> Once Adam had decided that he was going to know, he could no longer blame the Almighty. And we are in that position. We can no longer blame anybody but ourselves, because we know. And voluntary blindness, ignorance, is no excuse in the law court. Saying, <laughs> well, you know, I sort of didn't quite know about it. There's no way of solving this problem. I want to end with three very simple warnings. The first is, there is an industry of trying to spread doubt. The merchants of doubt are very well funded, largely from America, and very, very powerful. And if you want to see how powerful, remember they are the same people and the same mechanisms that was used in the United States particularly to stop legislation on smoking. 35 years the tobacco companies knew that their product caused people's death. And for 35 years they managed to spread enough doubt to stop legislation. And if you want to read about it, it's fascinatingly expressed in a book called 
um, the uh, Merchants of Doubt, uh, written by uh, uh, Naomi Oetsky, who is an American. It's a brilliantly written book. And the first chapter is about this. And when you read it, as you read each page, you know what's happening. You can see it today. It's exactly the same. It is to say, well, of course, it may be. We don't quite know, do we? Perhaps it's sunspots. Perhaps it's the way that the perhaps it's the way that the water in the clouds reacts. Perhaps it's something quite different. Well, they did all that on tobacco. And then they did it again. 25 years between understanding what acid rain was before they passed the legislation to stop acid rain. All the time it was, well, we're doing research into whether it might be some interaction between climate and the particular soils. Just as they said we're doing research to see whether it was uh, pollution uh, when they talked about uh, tobacco. And of course, who was funding that research? Well, Surprisingly enough, it was the smokestack uh, manufacturers and it was the tobacco companies. They funded the research, not because they wanted to know the answer, but because they wanted to be able to say there is research going on in all these things which shows that we're not quite sure that it is tobacco and lung cancer, that it is smokestack industries and uh, uh, acid rain. And that is exactly what they're doing today. They are using as many excuses as they can to suggest that there are doubts. I have to say to you, and I'm sure those of you here who study these matters would agree with me, there are no doubts. There are no doubts of a kind that would stop the sensible father of a family uh, taking action. And the only reason that we think there are even as many doubts as we do is because particularly the American coal industry is spending huge amounts. The Koch brothers alone have spent a billion dollars on campaigning against the belief in climate change. So don't kid yourself. This is a very well-funded and extremely powerful model. And the second warning is this. We really do have to get a sense of urgency. Because if we don't act, first of all, it will be more expensive. And secondly, and very quickly afterwards, it won't work because we will have had the increase in temperature, which will make life very difficult for large numbers of people. And again, without any reference, of course, to the uh, recent council elections, I'm not sure that some people who don't take seriously climate change talk about what happens when whole countries find that the sea level has risen <coughs> to a level which means they are no longer habitable. But we're moving a quarter of a million Bangladeshis every year now off where they are because they can't live there enough. There are a large number of Bangladeshis, about 170 million at the moment. If we actually think about a country which is quite capable of becoming uninhabitable for the most part because of its low life nature. We're not just talking about one or two uh, South Sea Islands. We're talking about something very much more serious. And if we look back into history, what have been the most disruptive things in history? They were large movements of populations. The Huns and the Vandals and the rest, what did they do? They totally turned over the established order because the established order demands a stability which is interrupted very often by war, certainly by famine, certainly by drought, certainly by flood, but more than ever by large movements of people driven out of where they live. So secondly, urgency is really serious. We have got to get people to see why it's urgent. And the third thing, and this is the biggest worry for me because I do not understand why I've not been able to convince governments of it. It seems to me so obvious. And that is that there is the most remarkable opportunity for British industry to be doing these things, to be able to sell these things, to be doing things cheaper because we do it with less energy, to be able to produce things which we can sell which other people can't produce because we are ahead of it. And yet, and therefore I refer to the only controversial point that 
was made by introduction, which was my telling the government that they were so wrong not to have a carbon intensity target. It's crucial. And it's crucial for a practical economic reason. If we have a carbon intensity target, which is fixed, which the government commits itself to, then people start putting their supply chain for the decarbonized industry here in Britain. Nobody's going to do that if they think we might fall off a cliff at the end of the fourth carbon budget. They're only going to do that if they recognize that this is a continuous situation in Britain so that they can manufacture here, so that they can export to other countries. And we are the basis upon which the new industry, which is the next step. How do have slow people are to remember what happens to industry? Industry doesn't move by a sort of uh, smooth passage at all. What happens with industry is that whole new concepts become absolutely central. Somebody invented the steam engine. That totally changed industry. It happened. Uh, somebody invented the electronics, the electronic world. And we've seen a whole series of facts that industry and the economy have been buoyed up by very, very big new things. I went to a meeting the other day, which is the fourth anniversary of the first one we put on. We put on a big conference. And four years later, we put another one for retailers. And I pointed out this. I said to, to people, when, when we moved into our house in Suffolk 27 years ago, we discovered that it was the house built in 1843. It was the house which had the first flush lavatory in Suffolk. The second flush lavatory in our village was put in in 1936. That's how long, that's how long uh, science took, technology took to catch on. When the first uh, video machine was put in, it was within four years everybody had a video machine. I looked at this audience and I said, um, if I'd asked you four years ago how many people had an iPad, there would have been no heads because there weren't any iPads. And I asked how many people got an iPad now. There was not a single person who didn't put their head up. The whole of this audience, universally, not just one, but that one, the whole of this audience, universally, had iPads. And that is what has happened in such short periods of time. Now, the next step for industry in this country is to show that you can do more with less, which is what sustainability is about. And it's also the recipe for profit. Profit is done when I do something cheaper than anyone else and charge the same price. That's when I get the best margin I possibly can. Then get pushed down. That's what always happens. And that's what ought to happen to us. So, energy and climate change, the challenge. The challenge is to do what we need to do because we know. The challenge is to recognize that doing small things add up to big things. The challenge is to realize that there is an urgency which we cannot avoid. The challenge is to recognize that this is a win-win situation because we not only protect ourselves against climate change, but we provide our industry for the first time since the decline of the old shipbuilding and coal producing industries. We provide us with a real economically viable industrial manufacturing base if only we get that right. The challenge is to recognize that this is a business of insurance and at the same time as doing what we have to do for climate change, we do what we're going to have to do anyway because of 9 billion people. And we do what we have to do anyway if we want to be secure in our supplies of gas and because if we want to make sure that we aren't just there, the, uh, the prey to a whole series of regimes, none of which we would want to be subject to. That's what the challenge is. The problem is that the challenge is so clear that one cannot understand why people don't understand. And our problem is that there are so many people who are determined to spread doubt, who are professionally involved in it, who have financial reasons to do it, and who believe somehow or other that it is better to sell a newspaper today and risk having no newspapers tomorrow. Those are the people that we have to convince. It's not because they don't know. It's because they don't want to know. And so, in my mind, the biggest question is that the challenge we are facing is the conversion of those who don't want to know 
to recognizing that they have to know and that they have to act. Well, firstly, uh, Lord Eden uh, certainly proved that uh, mankind has no need for PowerPoint. That's absolutely the case. Um, fantastic lecture. Uh, he has agreed kindly to take questions, and we do have some roving microphones, I think. So, uh, we have, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? One, one down here. So we're through the first one, as far away from the road and life point. Let's come your chief. <laughs> Hello, good evening. It's good to see you again. You remember we had you at London School of Economics. My question is, um, how do we engage in a developing country? Um, according to Marquise's report, seven of the ten, top ten growth economies will be from Africa. Um, I'm now involved with um, educating senior executives from Africa. What can we do? to get them to start the number system. Because it's not even on the road at all. Thank you. Well, first of all, we have to accept that we have to pay for it. No doubt about it. We've caused climate change. Britain has a particular debt about climate change because most of the climate change we have today comes from the early period of the Industrial Revolution and we were at the heart of that. And what's more, we are rich because of it. We were rich on pollution which we created. We didn't know, but that's what we did. So we do, I'm afraid, have a duty to pay for it. So there must be no doubt about where the money comes from. The money has to come from the rich nations who have grown rich on the pollution which now endangers the world. Second thing is that a number of African countries are doing remarkably well. Uh, South Africa, for example, has got a fantastic uh, policy and program which is beginning now. And indeed, I will just remind you that uh, we are not alone in fighting climate change. Perhaps the most advanced country in the world on fighting climate change is China. Americans always pretend it isn't, but China is doing remarkable things. And the five-year plan uh, is uh, one of the most ambitious uh, proposals there are. Uh, Mexico has got the best climate change legislation now passed uh, over the last uh, eight months uh, that probably in the world. Uh, South Korea has committed itself to uh, becoming carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, the uh, fact is that all over the world people are doing things and they might not want to sign up to it internationally because they rather think that other people ought to pay for it to people who, who, who ought to pay for it, and I understand that argument. But actually, China is now asking for international binding agreements because they recognize they're going to have to pay for much of what they're doing and th that we've really got to accept that this is a, a, a contest. The first. The second part of it is, is that we've really got to be much better at the transfer of, uh, of knowledge. And in a sense, it ought to be easier in Africa because where there is nothing, what comes could be made very, very much more the state of the art. And we've got, thirdly, to make it illegal to export to other countries technologies that we wouldn't use ourselves. The Danes uh, made a lot of fuss about closing down the last coal-fired power station. Six months later, they made a lot of fuss about saying that they had given a coal-fired power station to India. So what they'd done was to transfer the coal-fired power station from Denmark to India, get praise on both of them, and increase the pollution, because obviously the Indians were not as practiced in running these coal-fired power stations where the Danes had been. So they'd take two or three years to catch up with where the Danes had been, given that they'd taken many years to run these power stations. That's what they'd done and had no thought about the fact that they were transferring pollution. And one of the biggest things we've got to do is to stop exporting unacceptable technologies just because we can get away with it in some countries, particularly in Africa. Good evening. Um, I, I think one of the points I'd like to pick up is, is exactly how we can get this message across. I mean, I guess everybody in this room, certainly most people, but not everybody, would, would agree with everything you've said. Uh, but you, you, towards the end, you said you don't understand why you can't convince governments. Um, it, it seems a no-brainer that something must be done. And I, I like the analogy where you were talking about with Nigel Lawson, etc. 
and then what we did is clean up the air. Well, wouldn't that be good to clean up the air from pollution that we were leaving if it had nothing to do with climate change that we were doing? So it's a, it's a win-win situation there. But how do we engage people? It, the, the smoking example, the reason why there's almost, and we don't travel around a lot, there's almost a worldwide ban on smoking in public places. It's amazing the countries that have signed up to it. It's because of change in public opinion. Not because politicians suddenly said, you're not going to do that anymore. It's because there was so much opposition to smoking in public places. How do we engage people in this climate change uh, in order for them to take action? Because I don't believe the young people are the skeptics. I believe it's the people of our age who have some skeptics amongst them. Well, first of all, uh, I was not quite right about uh, smoking because uh, government was in a, it was, was considerably under pressure not to do what we did in Britain, for example. There was a majority who did not want the banning of smoking in public places. Uh, it was when it happened, uh, within six or nine months, people said, well, this is actually rather nice. This is, this is really rather better. Uh, if any of you have got any uh, doubts about UKIP, you might be interested to know that they would take the ban down. They would get rid of the ban. Just throw it. I mean, I can't think of a single thing they're right on, but that was very <laughs> uh, uh, entirely non part but I don't consider that. I consider that's a matter of choice between sense and nonsense. So that's but 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 so I think it is. A, there's a need for leadership. Frankly, there is a need for leadership. Uh, the second thing is, there is no simple way of doing this. We've all got to do it. And I've got three very simple things that I'd like to suggest to you. I want everybody in this room to go away and think to themselves, what is my other interest in life? What is the thing that I'm particularly uh, interested in? And I want to look at, every day, all the blogs in that area. So if it's stamp collecting, well, if it's stamp collecting, then all the blogs on stamp collecting. If it's... Uh, if it's um, uh, fencing or fishing or, or uh, the Catholic Church or whatever it is, take those blogs, ones that you may look at anyway, and every day read them and make sure that every time something silly about climate change comes on, you put the answer in. And whenever there's an opportunity in those conversations to introduce climate change and say the right thing, then do that. Now, if all this room did that, we would have a bigger effect on cyberspace than anything else. And it's a, it's a, this is a great opportunity that the internet gives us. We have power. Ordinary people have real power. But we just have to be lazy. We just have to get on with it and do it. And in a bit, you'll find there are several people doing it, and that's it. And then you begin to get the change. Then you begin to get people to realize that we have got to do it. Not somebody somewhere ought to do something about it. You've got to do something about it. And I think that's the first thing. Second thing is, every time we read some rubbish in the newspaper, the one trouble is I, I really can't dare the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Mail, so I don't read either of them. But I do hear about what they say, and uh, there are many people here who will read newspapers, and they'll read one of these things. You must write. The BBC takes seriously any occasion in which they have more than 20 letters of complaints about a programme. That's all. Because they know for every letter, there's a thousand people who are upset by whatever it is. So they take it really seriously. And we've just got to get much better at doing that, of writing, of saying that article, that article by David Rose in the Sunday, te uh, the Sunday Mail is nonsense. It's wrong here, here, and here. And, and we've got to go on doing that, and we write to the end, and finally the editor begins to realise that, that, that actually he's got to be a bit careful about it. Mail got very upset because uh, the British government corrected one of those articles in China because the Chinese were very worried about it. They did it in Chinese. The mail picked it up. The mail uh, immediately started saying the British government were going to be really difficult with you if you don't if you if you go on doing that. And uh, so the British government said we're merely quoting the science. But we've got to do it. Every one of us have got to write those letters. And thirdly, we've got to make sure that our Make sure that our politicians realise that this matters to you and to them. Now, I don't want anybody here not to have written to their local member of parliament to say, on a particular matter, not in a general way, but a particular matter, that this ought to happen, 
and then explain how important you think climate change is. Now, how many people in this audience have written to their member of parliament on the topic of climate change? Well, that's about four times the national average, so that's extremely good. <laughs> how many have been to see him or her at their surgery? Wonderful, thank you. Can I use you as my icon of these surgeries? <laughs> now, every member of parliament has a surgery. And every surgery, there ought to be somebody going to tell them why the most important thing that faces them is climate change. And know what the latest issue is. Every member of parliament begins to think, if there's just one a week, that they better be a bit serious about this. And first of all, they'll argue with you, if they're that kind. Then they'll begin to realise that they've got to listen. And the next step to that is that everybody here has got to see their Member of Parliament before the vote, which I believe will be in the beginning of June, on carbon intensity targets. It's very simple. We need them for British industry. British industry has asked to have them. The Climate Change Committee, which is the official advisor to the government, has said it's necessary. The government has agreed that it might happen, but not until after the next election. We don't want it after the next election, we want it now. And nobody here should let their Member of Parliament not know that that's what they think, and you have a month to do it, and that will begin to change things. We only change things by work. The difference between success and failure is work. And all of us have a duty to make sure that nobody in this area, no member of parliament, and, and if they're good and they're on side, and there are quite a number of them around here who are on side, if they're good and they're on side, then for goodness sake, make sure that they, you've been to see them, because you want them to feel that they're supported. It's miserable. You know, I, I did a speech last night, huge conference, um, of very key people, and at it was a very senior journalist of one of our more sensible newspapers. <laughs> So you can see which two I'm referring to. <laughs> and, uh, and he came up to me afterwards and he said, thank you very much. I am now invigorated again. People get very lonely in this game. And so do make sure if your member of parliament, if he's good or I think she's good, isn't lonely. Because he or she knows that there's a real phallic to people out there who agree with them, support them. And if they're not like that, get them frightened. <laughs> Just get them frightened. Because then they begin to take this seriously. Yep, one more down here, I think. There's one there. Um, I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but it's a much bigger issue um, to do with something you've mentioned sort of several times, which is population. With 9 billion people in by 20, mid 2030s, we've only got 20 years left. I don't see how we'll be able to cope environmentally in terms of pressure of water, phosphorus, um, biodiversity, land use. I just don't see how it's going to happen. What's your comment on that? Well, um, you can take um, the view of Praise God Fairbanks. Remember, he was the Puritan leader who said life was absolutely miserable. And we may have realized how miserable it is, and how difficult it is, and how awful it is. And he lost. Because in the end, people don't want to be made miserable. And they don't do anything if they're made miserable. Because what they say is, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. And what happened with, praise God, bare bones was that people wanted Christmas back. And they wanted, they wanted, um, they, they needed, they felt they needed mince pie because they didn't see why they shouldn't have. So I start from the assumption that we're going to have 9 billion people, so we've got to sort it out. These are questions, we've got to sort them out. And the great advantage is that the richer they become, the fewer children they have. That's the one thing we do know. Uh, uh, you can put around as many condoms as you like and work. Never has work, won't work in the future, so don't bother. What you've got to do, you've got to have them available, but there's no point, they're not going on their own. What you've got to do is to raise people's standards of living so they don't have to have ten children in order to look after their old age. And you raise the health system so that they don't feel that five of them might die. 
So once you get into that situation, you get into the other end of it, which we've got in Europe, which is that, you know, go on like this 200 years, there won't be any Italians. Now, I don't mind losing, I don't mind losing, I don't mind losing Mr. Berlusconi, but I can think of one or two of those rather lovely ladies that I use, that I don't want to lose. So, so we're going to have a different issue in, 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 uh, in, in this part of the world. So, so I, I just say to you, yes, it's very tough. The reason it's very tough is because we now know so much about these things. And we've got to learn to live with knowledge and not allow knowledge so to bow us down that we can't solve it. Because the truth is, the technology is there to solve it. We can do it. But we can only do it if we get on with it. And therefore, don't make people miserable by saying, oh, I'll tell you what is there. My life's here and I hope you won't mind me telling you. But one of the things is, it's no good telling me to do that which needs to be done when I'm doing this. And anybody here who is married knows that this is a sexual differentiation, which is you're getting on with what you want to do because it's got to be done, and somebody suggests three other things you've got to do at the same time. And I think that's the problem with your question. Get on with it. And don't get yourself depressed by the fact that there are a lot of other things you ought to get on with as well. change to me is a bit of noise. The question is there is practically no education being given to people. How do you reduce your energy costs? How do you make yourself comfortable at a lower cost? You know, if you look at the advertisement for old age projects, oh we will supply money so they can have central heated places, but they don't tell them that how all they need is one warm room and they don't have to heat the house but yet the education is we will supply central heating for a full house is the cash to do so if you haven't got it i think that's defeating the object a bit i agree but just look at this room he's not got a coat on he's not got a coat on why on earth have we heated this room so that it's almost impossible to be in it? It's an outbreak. What, what is this university doing? <laughs>